welcome on our guest. Everybody, please welcome David Diga Hernandez. How are you doing tonight, bro? With you. I'm so excited to have you on. Tonight is going to be powerful. Guys, this is... Now, I want to say this before we get started here. I had him on the podcast several months ago. I wrote him said, hey, I would love to bring you back on. You know, God has definitely grown the, the podcast since then. We're on different platforms now. And I told him a lot of you have just gotten baptized in the Holy Spirit. A lot of you... Let's just be real. Your churches don't talk about the supernatural gifts of the Spirit. They don't talk about the moving of the Holy Spirit. We've been talking, David, so much recently about the supernatural realm, about the moving of the Holy Spirit. And in my mind, I was praying and I just thought, what better person to have on right now for such a time as this? Not only that, I know you're doing a ton of events in California, and I know a lot of them are going to want to be going to those events. But I just want to say this before we start. You are a brother to me. You are a friend to me. But you really are a brother. You know, you. I have a lot of ministry friends, a lot of people... Um, but I consider you a brother, you know, we text, we have our group text, and I feel like if I needed anything, I could call you. You've opened the door to me, and guys, I want to tell you, you know, I've gotten a lot of opportunities and even bookings from him having me on his show. He has an incredible studio in Los Angeles, and out of anybody I know, now guys, I'm not, I'm not saying this just to hype up. You guys know me. I'm not saying this just to toot his horn. There is nobody right now that is, I believe, especially in our generation, that has the knowledge, the wisdom, the revelation on the person of the Holy Spirit than David Diga Hernandez. When I think of the person of the Holy Spirit and someone that's teaching and preaching and getting close to him and knows him, I think of David Diga. So, bro, I want to say it is an honor to have you on. I'm excited to have you on tonight. Tonight's going to be amazing. I know my people are fired up. You know, they're hungry to hear about it. Um, I We were talking a little bit about it before, but I think right now is a, is a crazy time we live in that the church is not talking about the spiritual gifts, not talking about the power of the Holy Spirit, that we've been given this incredible gift of the Holy Spirit who's a person, and in that there's gifts that he gives, and yet it seems like, bro, the church is not walking in the supernatural power and the gifts we've been given, mm -hmm. and I think a lot of pastors are tired, they're weary, they're struggling because we've been given tools, supernatural tools, and for some reason we're not using the tools we've been given. I was reading a statistic not too long ago, some of you might have heard me share this, and they said that restaurants and companies love gift cards, and I was thinking, what is this article, and I, I started reading it, and this is what they said, they said one out of every three gift card that gets purchased does not get used. And a lot of you know this is true because you have a pile of gift cards to restaurants you don't even like sitting in your kitchen drawer somewhere that you've never used. And I, I, I started thinking about that, how we just toss gift cards in a drawer somewhere and forget about them and don't use them. And I realized this is what we're doing as the body of Christ with the spiritual gifts that the Holy Spirit has given us. We put them in a drawer somewhere. We say, you know, we're going to do this thing on our own. We don't really need them. And I'm thinking it's going to be a sad day when we get to heaven and realize we had all these gifts we could have used on earth to advance the kingdom of God and we never didn't and we never ended up using them. Now is the time the world is longing for a supernatural display of God's kingdom on the earth, and it's time that we stop waiting around for the gifts to fall in our lap, but I believe it's time for us to pursue spiritual gifts. So I just want to say I'm excited to have you on. Um, I love you, bro. I appreciate you, bro, and you know, do what you want to do, man. I'm excited to have you on the broadcast. Well, first of all, my friend, I want to say thank you uh, for having me come back onto this broadcast again, and I do want everyone to know this. I feel the exact same way. Isaiah Saldivar is my brother, and um, it's an honor to be with you. And I'm I'm thankful that you even thought of me for your 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 broadcast here. Which I'm you know sometimes when you're on the inside looking out, it's difficult to see how things are shaping out to be. But from the outside in, looking at what God's doing with you, Isaiah, and I'm sure everyone who's watching will agree. God, you, you right now in the spirit, God has you like a shooting star. And I really do believe that we're going to see your ministry and the, the voice that God's given to you be amplified all across the nation. So I consider it an honor uh, to know. I'll be able to say I knew Isaiah Saldivar when he was <laughs> just on. getting started. I'll be able to <laughs> say on. that. And then those of you guys on the stream will be able to say, man, we were watching when it was just under a thousand. This is before it was, you know, a hundred thousand people watching at a time. And I think it'll get there. So my friend, um, it's a privilege to be on with you. And you said something interesting about the Holy Spirit. Uh, you talked about the fact that many churches are not talking about him. Here's the reality, and I'm just, I know I can be real here come with on, you guys. Come on. Um, the reason churches don't talk about the Holy Spirit is because they're being run by a different spirit. Wow. Which is plain and simple. 
Wow. If they were being run by the Holy Spirit, there would be no shame in anything that he does or that he offers. And so I want to talk to you, those of you who are watching, about some of the things with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So when I was praying about this broadcast, I was just back and forth with the Lord saying, okay, Lord, do you want me to uh, come and, and, and just preach an inspirational message or do you want me to teach? Because the Lord's given me a double-edged sword on the mm. way I minister. Sometimes it's passionate preaching and other times it's very methodical, laid out teaching. And so, so today um, I want to talk about the gifts of the Holy Spirit because the Word and the Spirit are needed together. Mm. Uh, and I want to talk about the gifts of the Holy Spirit in a from a teaching perspective. So those of you watching, pull out your um, your notepads, or I'm sure you're all watching on digital devices. Uh, so use notes there, whatever you have to do, and pull out your Bibles. I'm going to be reading out of the New Living Translation primarily. But I want to talk to you about discovering and activating your spiritual gifts. And primarily, I want to talk about activating this gift of speaking in tongues. Mm. Here's the reality. If you have been struggling to pray in tongues, if you've been frustrated, you've been wondering, why does it happen for other people and not for me? I've gone to the events. I've prayed the prayers. I'm going to guarantee you this. If you apply what I teach you Come right on. here, right now, I promise you 100% guaranteed you'll be praying in tongues before the end of this stream. Come on. And I, I believe that by faith because I know the principles that are being taught here. So let's first go to 1 Corinthians 12. And Isaiah, I hope that's okay. I'm going to yes, be doing more. Yes, yes, perfect, teaching. perfect. Okay, so, so let, let's get into the word here. Um, I'm going to be doing a, what you would call an expository teaching of 1 Corinthians 12. In other words, we're going to go down the verses, and I'm going to so show good. you what these things mean in, in relation to the Holy Spirit because I believe in building on the principles of the word. So, Father, in Jesus' name, I pray today, Lord, that you would anoint this preaching, this teaching, as I'm preaching it out of your word. And I pray that your word would go forward like a hammer and break mindsets and break mentalities. And I ask you, Father, for the inspiration of the Spirit to breathe upon this which is being spoken. And I pray, Lord, that you would impart gifts, gifts of the prophetic, gifts of discernment, gifts of tongues, gifts of healing. And I thank you, Lord, that you're doing it now. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. And I want all of you who are watching, because you agree, say amen. amen. By the way, um, there's a free ebook I'm giving away. It's called How Jesus Healed the Sick. Come on. And this is, this is separate than the, the gift of healing. This is, the, this is the operation, the function of the healing ministry. So if you want to know about that, I'm giving that away 100% for free, no strings attached. Uh, just go to that link that Isaiah posted there in the comment section, and you'll be able to see that link. It's the third one. Click it. It's a one email, and then drop. It's done. You'll get that book within seconds. So good. Okay, so let's go to 1 Corinthians 12, chapter, one, or chapter 12, verse number 1. This is what the Scripture says. And this is Paul the Apostle talking to the Corinthian church. He says, now, dear brothers and sisters, regarding your question about the special abilities, or the KJV would put the spiritual gifts the Spirit gives us, I, want you, I don't want you to misunderstand this. You know that when you were still pagans, you were led astray and swept along in worshiping speechless idols. Verse 3, so I want you to know that no one speaking by the Spirit of God will curse Jesus, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Okay, so first and foremost, Paul the Apostle is talking to the Corinthian church here. And the Corinthian church was basically existing in a culture that was permeated with perversion. So there was an old phrase in the ancient world that went to live like a Corinthian. It was almost the modern day law. It was almost like the ancient time Las Vegas, where you know if you're going to Vegas, you're pretty much up to no good wow. because there's not much else to do out there. So to live like a Corinthian meant you lived in sexual immorality. It meant you lived in debauchery. You lived in sorcery. By the way, that word sorcery, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 12, sorcery in the Greek is pharmakia. It literally means drug use. Wow. So sorcery, drug use is sorcery. And that's a sin that will keep you out of the kingdom of heaven. And so they would practice sorcery. They would practice parting. They would practice, uh, they would have orgies. They would worship multiple different gods. I mean, this was a society that was, as I said, permeated with perversion. So Paul the Apostle says, look, I don't want you to misunderstand this. Here's the power of God. Here's the power of the Spirit. This is what God wants to give you. He says, but I don't want you to misunderstand. Now, wait a minute. What doesn't he want them to misunderstand wow. there? Why was, what, what distinction was he trying to draw there? He was trying to help them discern between demonic power and Holy Spirit power. 
because they lived in a time where they worshipped idols. I mean, they would worship uh, Poseidon, Aphrodite, Asclepius, the god of prophecy, the god of war, the god of sex, you name it. They had a god for everything and they could attach an adjective to so there was that ancient saying to live like a Corinthian. This is who Paul is writing to. Now, the church is coming out of that. They're coming out of that old power. They're coming out of that old d dominion. And by the way, there is such a thing as demonic power. This is what we saw in the book of Genesis when God says, I'm going to show myself strong against the gods of Egypt. Those ancient creatures you sing being depicted in hieroglyphics were not just metaphors. Those were actual beings that government powers interacted with. That's a whole different message for a whole different time. But the reality is, is that there are demons. Demons are not metaphors. They, they exist. They're actual sentient beings that exist in an unseen world, and they're bent on your destruction. So he's writing to them saying, I don't want you to confuse the power you're receiving now for wow. any of that pagan power. Now, here's the question, though. What's the major difference? Because, because if, if you lay hands on the sick and someone gets healed, and some witch doctor lays hands on the sick and they get healed— what really is the measure against which you can hold that miracle and say, well, this was demonic or it wasn't? Or what's the difference between a prophet and a psychic? What's the difference between when, when someone in an Eastern world babbles in an unknown language and when I pray in the tongues of heavenly languages? What, what, what's the difference between when somebody falls out under the power of the Holy Spirit in a Pentecostal charismatic or spirit-filled church and you compare that to something in the Eastern religion where they open up what they would call a chakra? Wow. Some people have compared the power of the Holy Spirit to con Delini. So what's the difference between these demonstrations and how do you have this standard? How do you find that standard Come that keeps on. you grounded to where you don't wander into demonic power because you're so hungry to experience something that's supernatural? Well, he gives us that answer in verse three. Look right here. So let's go, let's read verse two and then jump down. So that's the context here. Look what he says. You know that when you were still pagans, you were led astray and swept along in worshiping speechless idols. So now he's talking about that demonic power. And then verse three, what does he say? So I want you to know that no one speaking by the Spirit of God will curse Jesus. Wow. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now, that right off the bat could seem oversimplified. But Paul the Apostle is not saying that the individual who is filled with the Holy Spirit um, or the individual who's operating in a demonic power cannot make the phonetic pronunciation saying Jesus is Lord. In fact, Matthew chapter 7, verses 23 through 25 refute that. It's very clear that someone can say with their mouth, Jesus is Lord and operate in demonic power. That's wow. an absolute possibility. What he says here instead is the reality. He's talking about the reality that you will not have a sincerity to your worship of Jesus as Lord if you're walking in a demonic power. You ever wow. notice that you go to some church services and there's no power. There's plenty of teaching of the word, but there's no power. In other words, they have the information without the demonstration. You'll go to another church and you'll see that they have the power, but not once do you hear Jesus mentioned. It's all about the prophecy. It's Come all on. about the laying on of hands. It's all about everything else that goes on there. And those are wonderful manifestations. But the problem is that if you remove the substance, you're left without the grounding for the power. This computer is functioning because we have it plugged into a wall and it's grounded. The mm. cable is grounding the power and it's causing that power to go into this computer and move about and power all of the intricacies that are broadcasting my voice and image to you. But if you were to take that same power and remove the grounding, it wouldn't broadcast me, it would fry me. And that's the problem with some believers is they leave the substance of the word, they leave the substance of the character of Christ, and they chase after signs not realizing that wow. when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you don't have to chase after signs. Ch signs will chase after you. Come on. And so the grounding of the power of the Holy Spirit is that focus, is that word, is that substance, that foundation, that solid, stable place upon which we stand. Now, that's what he's saying in verse 3. So he's not saying that if you say with your mouth those words, Jesus is Lord, that, oh, well, that validates your power. You're one of us. No, he's talking about a sincere bowing to the Lordship of Christ and the message behind the miracles, not the methods, because people criticize methods all the time. People criticize Isaiah's methods. I'll Come tell you, on. Isaiah, half the people who criticize your method, A, it's because they're jealous because they've never Come had on. a thousand people packed into one place. And then B, it's because they don't understand that the Holy Spirit can move through new methodology. Come on. So the miracles are the same. You were telling me this story. I just about ran through this wall right here, hearing that story about the person who was healed of COVID-19. And I'm thinking, okay, this is this is the power of God. This is this is what God is doing. This is how God is operating. And so you can see the move of the Holy Spirit in this. 
And the problem is if you're used to what the Holy Come Spirit on. does, then you'll never see what he's actually doing that's new. So, for example, the Bible says that Moses knew God's ways and the children of Israel knew his actions. What's the wow. difference between knowing his nature and his actions? Well, when I know his actions, I judge him based upon what he's done, and I look at any one thing and I say, well, I've never seen God do this before. He must not be in it. But when I know the nature of God, I can look at something and say, well, this looks like something that God would do because I'm familiar with his person. Wow. So Paul the Apostle, again, to, to reemphasize, Paul the Apostle is not saying that just anybody who says Jesus is Lord is therefore validated in their miracle ministry. What he is saying is that somebody who is saying that Jesus is Lord sincerely and operating in this power is going to have that lifestyle that's reflective of the nature of Christ, and number two, is going to point to Jesus, not themselves. Anytime a prophet is pointing to themselves as the answer, you got to be very, very careful about that gift. Okay, so now he's saying, I don't want you to confuse it for pagan power. Moving on now. Um, this is what's so interesting. Moving on to verse four. Watch this. See, I want to see in the comments if you guys can spot this. And if, if you're watching from, if, if you're one of my viewers, uh, you probably already know this. So no cheating. If you've heard me say <laughs> this before, don't, don't say what it is. Okay, let's give someone else a chance. Okay, verse four. There are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same spirit is the source of them all. Mm. There are different kinds of service, but we serve the same Lord. God works in different ways, but it is the same God who works in all of us. This is a reference to the Trinity. You wow. see there the Spirit, the Lord, and the Father, the God. So these three together all decided. Think about this. So these three together all decided which gifts you would have. These three together, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, in times past, a celestial conversation took place, and they decided in unity which spiritual gifts you would have. This is wow. why Romans chapter 11, verse 29 tells us that the gifts in the call of God are without repentance. What the Trinity decides in unity, Trinity, try unity, what the Trinity decides in unity can never be undone. They are final. That decision has been made. There's no going back. Now watch this. Verse 7, a spiritual gift is given to each of us. Whoa, okay, two things here. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so that we can help each other. Wow. Okay, so there's two truths that are very plain right there. I can't tell you how many times somebody has says, asked me, do I have a spiritual gift? Has God given me something to use or I haven't really discovered my spiritual gift yet. Are you sure he's actually given? The Bible says right there. Come on. In verse 7, 1 Corinthians 12, that he's given to each of us. Who? The body of Christ. Each and every single one of us have received a spiritual gift. This, by the way, is why one of the reasons, one of the many reasons, why I don't believe that the gifts have ceased. Because if the gifts ceased, and this theory that the apostles were the only ones that operated in these gifts, then Paul the Apostle would have never said that each believer has been given at least one of these gifts, which, are, which include the gifts of the working of miracles and the gifts of healing. He is not saying that these gifts have ceased. He's saying that each believer has one of these for sure. Wow. You know what? I think we lost you. Can you hear me? I think we just dropped the internet. Can you guys hear me? Check one, two. Let me know if you guys can hear me. The devil is a liar. Let me see here if I could get him back on. Let me know if you guys can hear me. I don't know if you guys are still on here. It looks like the call dropped out. Frozen. Okay, let me try to fix this. Give me one second here. Let me call him back on the app. Let me see. Let me get him back on here. Stay with us, guys. Quick bathroom break. We're going to get him back on the call. The devil is a liar. I know everyone's freaking out in the comments now. We're going to get back on. Don't worry. Don't worry. We're going to get him back on here. It looks like the internet is completely cut out here on the Discord app. I'm actually surprised that the, okay, you guys can hear me. Okay, we're gonna get this fixed, don't worry. The internet app is actually completely, there we go. Can you hear me? Oh, you got me back. Okay, we're back, we're back, we're back. All right, guys. Okay, verse seven. Okay, let me see. He's One. saying that each, can, can you hear me now? Yeah, you're good, we're back. Okay, praise the Lord, verse seven. <laughs> okay, verse seven. 
The Bible is teaching us very clearly that God has given to each of us a spiritual gift. So there is not one among us wow. that has has been left without a gift. Every and that I I really feel like I mean I rarely say this, but I really think that that is something that that many believers are are struggling to overcome, especially in this generation. Because not only are we not talking about the supernatural, come on, but even in the time when everybody was talking about the supernatural, very few people actually believe that they could operate in these gifts. It's an odd thing that we can look at someone else and say, "Oh, well, God must be willing to use them." But we often disqualify ourselves because we know ourselves so well. So wow. I want to say this. It's a very simple so point. Good. It's not all that deep, but it's something that needs to really be driven home because there are people watching me right now who have disqualified themselves mentally and they've emotionally disconnected from the idea that they ever could carry a spiritual gift. But the reality is the spiritual ability has nothing to do with my ability or your ability. So good. You watching this, you're watching this. You can hear me teaching this. You're a believer. First Corinthians 12, seven teaches very clearly that a spiritual gift has been given to each of us. Now watch this, watch this now. The spiritual gift has been given to each of us. Why? Why? So we can help each other. Now, this is going to be key for a couple of reasons. So remember that phrase that the gift has been given to us for a specific reason so that we can help each other. Let me say this and make it very clear. The gifts are for service, not for status. Come on. I am, I'm just going to be very honest with you. I, I believe God is sick. And I mean, like, like, like prophetically speaking, like as far as apocalyptic imagery goes, and anytime you see in the Old Testament when God was disgusted with something, he would talk about wanting to vomit things out of his mouth. And I think very few things on, have sickened the Holy Spirit quite like the influencer culture mentality that has come into the church and onto preachers. This idea that mm. we have to consult with our marketing techniques instead of the Holy Spirit, this idea come on. that we have to guard our fragile reputations lest anybody dismiss us or cancel us, this idea that I to declare something that will create a global platform. I love what our friend Vladimir Savchuk says. He says, don't build... Don't build people to build your platform. Build your platform to build people. Come on. And I love that mentality, which is about people. Too many preachers look at themselves like celebrities instead of servants. Come on. And we become the puppets of the culture. Instead of confronting the culture, what we end up doing is saying things that we think are safe. But God did not give you a platform to be safe. Say God it. gave you a platform because he wants to get his message across. So when it comes to the spiritual gifts, it's not about ourselves. You know, we talk about ministry as if it's something that God's doing for us. Ministry is not a promotion. It's a crucifixion. Come on. Ministry Ooh. is not a promotion. It's a crucifixion. It is utter death to self. It is the laying yourself upon the altar and doing away with desires. Think about what happened with Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. He, he was sitting there praying and three times he asked the Lord, three times he asked the Father, please let this cup of suffering pass from me. But he says, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Wow. Ministry is the death of the will. It's not about your dreams. It's not your path to success. It's not the means by which you make yourself important. Ministry is service. Ministry is the stripping of self, the going low and reaching and touching the Come people on. of God. This is why God gives us a spiritual gift. And as soon as we recognize that God gives us gifts for service and not for status, it makes it more easy to operate in because many times we think we don't deserve a gift when in fact it's Say not something it. that's necessarily deserved. It's something that God gives you that Come you might on. serve. So when we look when we look at the spiritual gifts like a privilege, then, then we have trouble going, well, I don't think I deserve that privilege. Now, wait a minute. That's like saying I don't deserve the privilege of, of cleaning the restrooms at the church, or I don't Come deserve on. the privilege of, of doing these things. Now, I understand that there is some sense, in some sense, we do need to have a higher standard for those who would be given platform ministry. But as far as the spiritual gifts go, we must recognize that they are given to us not as a reward, but a responsibility. They're so not for good. show or for status. They are for service. They're not to lift your name, but to lift your brothers and sisters. So remember, spiritual gifts are others-centered. The spiritual gift God has given you is others-centered. It's not centered on you. It's not centered on drawing a following oh. or drawing a platform. It's centered on helping others. And when you do that, God says, hey, 
I can trust you with that. Why do you think God's raising Isaiah Saldivar? Do you think God's raising Isaiah Saldivar because Isaiah was careful about uh, what he said and 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 Come consulted on, with the marketing firms and checked on the 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 analytics of what he had said last week and see what was popular and what was not? Or do you think God is raising Isaiah Saldivar because he just reads the word and repeats it and says what God says? I'm telling you, God raises this man because he just says what needs to be said. And whatever you want to do with that truth, he Come doesn't on. even leave that up to you. Says it's between me and God. And so that is a perfect example of why God will raise someone. So gifts are for service, not for status. Now watch this. This is so I good. I really do. I sense a strong anointing. This here. is really so good. Do. This is so good. So verse number eight, to one person, the spirit gives the ability of the wise advice. Now we're going to list some spiritual gifts for you, okay? Wise advice, which is the, the gift of the word of wisdom. To another, the spirit gives the, special, the gift of special knowledge or the word of knowledge. Verse 9, the same spirit gives great faith to another. And to someone else, the one spirit gives the gift of healing. He gives one person the power to perform miracles and another the ability to prophesy. He gives someone else the ability to discern whether a message is from the spirit of God or from another spirit. That's discernment. Still another person is given the ability to speak in unknown languages or tongues, while another is given the ability to interpret what is being said. It is the one and only Spirit who distributes all these gifts. He alone decides which gift each person should have. Now, I'm going to jump back just for a second. I want to reference here, and I won't read the whole thing, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 through 28, we're given this full description of how the body functions together. Mm. And before we go on to the list, I do think it's important to lay down one more foundational truth, and that is this. The spiritual gifts can be used and should be used in operation with one another. In other words, for example, Ephesians 4.11, which we're going to read in a little bit, lists five different what we would call office gifts. The apostle, the prophet, the teacher, the evangelist, and the pastor. Those five gifts are what God has given to the church or what Christ has given to the church to help lead the church and guide the church and help the church grow. But all of them work in, in harmony with one another. These, these gifts are most powerful when we're united. Wow. Now, if you take the perspective that spiritual gifts are for status, when you have a status perspective of the gifts, it breeds competition. Wow. The Go spiritual there. gifts are meant for complementing one another, not competition, Gosh. complementing. So when we complement one another, we're able to look at someone else because we're secure in who we are Come in on. Christ. We can promote someone else. You know, I'm not trying to be dishonoring of anybody who's gone before us. And any believer that has gone before us in generations past deserves our honor and our respect. So I won't use any names, but there's, there's really no secret. And then many of these men from that era will admit it, that in the days of televangelism, when it was at its peak, there was a lot of competition Come between on. these men. And they'll tell you it actually destroyed ministries. The competition destroyed ministries. I, can, I, could, I could tell you story after story, horrible stories that I've been told it's by true. men of God who were in that. And we're talking not, not just like simple competition, like, oh, he's got more book sales than I do. Let me go and try to write a better book. No, we're talking like trying to catch each other in secret Come sins on. and expose it so that you can take the guy out. That's how bad it got. And, and what ended up happening is that that charismatic move, what we would call the charismatic move, which was a move of the Holy Spirit, if you want to put a label on it even, but that move was, was destroyed in part because of this competition. Wow. I pray that this, please hear me now, I pray, it's, it's been my heart's cry since, I remember crying out since I was 16 after reading about it, I prayed, God, don't let that happen with my generation. And I said, Lord, if you raise me, I'll be one who opens doors. Come I'll be on. one who connects. I'll be one who supports. I'll be one who promotes others. I'll be one who prefers others. I'll be one who helps in whatever way I can. And that has been my philosophy. And I'm praying that God would use my life to make sure that that doesn't happen in this generation. But you and I must determine within our hearts that when it comes to spiritual gifts, that we not become competitive. And com competition doesn't just happen on the macro scale. It also happens at the local church level. Come on. I mean, instead of worshiping through the worship service, one worship leader might be mad because they gave the lead of that song to another person so when they true. wanted it, and they feel like they're being taken over. Now it takes over their whole worship. 
we talk about people, well, why did they pick that guy to pray and not me? Or why is that guy leading a Bible study and not me? Or why is that guy being promoted to a pastor and not me? Or why are they being given ministry and not me? And that is the problem. We must stop looking at it like that. If you have an issue when others are raised, it's because you're coming at the spiritual gift from a status mentality. And status mentality is rooted in insecurity. Wow. Insecurity is what causes this status mentality because you have to attach your self-worth to exterior things Mm. and because you attach your self-worth exterior things now it when someone else does better than you it devalues who you imagine that you are and this is why we have to stay away from this and god is going to anoint you listen those of you watching god is going to anoint you god is going to use you but you must make sure this thing doesn't take root in your heart because the moment that, and, and you may say, oh, that would never happen to me. It's human nature. Come and I'm on. telling you what happens to, it can happen to anyone. It's like a garden. If you're not pulling the weeds, eventually you're going to choke out all the life that you've worked so hard to put in there. Now, coming now to the spiritual gifts, I'm going to list some things. I'm not going to go through all of them in detail. Uh, that would be quite an extensive <laughs> teaching. <laughs> I mean, we would probably go, I, I'm serious. This was like a, what? This could be like a three hour teaching, Tim. He has a lot of my... <laughs> This is like a three-hour thing, so we're not going to do that. I'm just going to give you a brief survey of each spiritual gift, and then maybe something will spark in you. Oh, you know what I am working on? Uh, There's a website we're working on that's going to help people discover their spiritual gifts. That's so cool. So that's coming out, I think, in July. So we'll we'll, we'll, we'll talk more about that. But anyway, okay, first and foremost, the categories. Okay, I'm going to give you three categories of spiritual gifts. You won't find these categories in the Bible. I created them to help you memorize them. Mm. and and they're just that's all they are okay so number one there's the leadership gifts now all gifts can be used in some leadership capacity but again these are just terms they don't necessarily hold any real definition on the actual gifts themselves number two is the service gifts okay now all gifts are used for service we just read that but again this is just something for the sake of categorization and then number three the power gifts now, everybody mm. likes the power. I was going to say, want, come oh, I on want now. Healing. I want the word of knowledge. I want that. But but can I tell you, I'm going to be real honest. I think the most powerful gifts are what I would categorize as the, the service gifts. Good. I really think so. It would be like, like, like the power gifts are like the icing on the cake, but the cake itself is like the service gifts. So good. Now, now watch this. So Romans, I'll give you two portions of scripture, and you can go back and look at them later. Um, but Romans, I'll give you three portions. Romans 12, 8. Romans 12, 7, and 1 Corinthians 12, 28. Okay? So the gift of exhortation is found in Romans 12, 8. This is the gift of encouragement. Now, why is this powerful? When we're talking about the service gifts, remember this. All of these things could just be abilities within themselves. I mean, anybody can encourage, right? Mm. Anybody has that choice where they can go and encourage someone. But watch this. This is why it's so powerful. You're going to love this. So Imagine having the gift of encouragement. You ever find somebody that is just in such a dark place in their life? Come on. Like no matter, their wife talks to them, their parents talk, and no matter who talks to them, says what, they're just, they can't get out of this. And, and your heart goes out to them and you're thinking, oh my goodness, how do I pull them out of this place? And you're like frustrated. Someone with the gift of encouragement can go in there, start talking, and that thing starts breaking off that person. So good. I was, I was with a friend of mine who, who was in a hospital. He had a surgery that went wrong. And it was a terrible, terrible time of suffering from, I mean, I, I, I actually, his parents weren't getting any sleep. So I went in uh, to the hospital with my friend. I spent the night there at the hospital and, and worked, helped help change the tubes. I had to help him get up and use the restroom in the middle of the night. Wow. I had to, I mean, I was cleaning up the, everything. It was, and, and I remember seeing right there firsthand his suffering, mm. just constant coughing, phlegm coming up and constant pain. It was, it was really hard to watch him go through that. And you know me, man of faith and power, or so Come I thought. On. I'm over there reading him scriptures. I'm trying to encourage. Nothing was breaking that. I prayed for him again and again. Nothing broke. His parents would come in, pray for him. Nothing. We had people bring in, you know, worship and da 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 da. Nothing could be done. But there was this woman. In fact, it's uh, uh, Isaiah Stephen Moctezuma's mother, okay. Patricia. Now you know Steve. Last time he was on your your show, Steve talked about his brother Michael, and yes. his brother Michael has has that disease. It's a debilitating disease that basically eats away at your muscle uh, use, and he's in a wheelchair now. Now Michael 
has gone through suffering like you you wouldn't believe, but he's still encouraged. So so Patricia comes and 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 she starts talking to this individual in the hospital. All she does is repeat to him what Michael had sent. Oh, this is powerful. Mm. What Michael had sent. Michael, who's in a wheelchair, who can't eat food. Michael, who, wow. who can't even leave the house hardly, sends a word through his mom to go give to this guy in the hospital, and it broke. Come on. It was like when she walked in and shared that word, the atmosphere shifted. So don't tell me the gift of encouragement is a lesser so gift. So good. It is the power to break those things. Like what, what healing does for sicknesses, encouragement so does good. for people in darkness and depression wow. and with fear. Encouragement. Think about even the word encouragement. Encourage, to put courage in, to do away so with fear. So that is a powerful gift, the gift of encouragement. Number two is the gift of giving. These are people who are generous, not necessarily just with finances, though it works like that. But in other words, they have a grace upon their lives to where God puts resources in their hands, whether that be financial so or open doors, God puts resources in their hands and they have a deal with God, so to speak. And as they distribute, God just keeps pouring into them. That's the gift of giving. Now, David, I want to interrupt you real quick because I know a lot of people in the chat, as you're saying this, are starting to think of other people and they're starting to realize this is now making sense. Why this person's this way. Guys, what we're saying and what he's saying is this is supernatural gifts. These are not abilities that you get or you learn at a leadership camp. These are supernatural gifts that do something in the spirit realm. And even as you're teaching right now, David, I'm thinking of people in the chat right now people get, that give every single stream i have people in here that literally give every single stream like and then you have other people that won't give a dollar but you think about the supernatural gift god has given certain people and then you realize okay this is a supernatural thing this is not natural this is something in the spirit realm and i really feel like as you're saying this and tonight people are realizing gifts that they've had that have been dormant and i'm telling you guys let these gifts wake up inside of you begin to pursue these gifts because as you're talking i had to stop you there because i really am starting to think of people and now i know people in the chat are saying oh my gosh this is starting to make sense now because i know people that have this gift but no one ever spoke that no one ever recognized that you don't ever hear pastors get up on sunday morning and say hey we just really want to thank so and so they have the supernatural gift of administration mm -hmm. or the supernatural gift of giving we don't ever recognize that we only recognize who oh isaiah's coming in he does miracles or, oh, David's coming in. He does, you know, has the gift of faith and the gift of healing or so-and-so's. We don't ever hear about all these other gifts that you're talking about that are functioning, building the body of Christ, moving. And so a lot of people right now in the chat, there's over 600 of you. You don't even think you have gifts because we've failed to highlight and recognize all these other gifts you're talking about because they're not glamorous or they're not popular. Yet these are powerful gifts that God is using you, using me, using us to advance his kingdom. So I really want to, I'm, I just speak to those gifts and I say, come alive in Jesus name, because some of you are going to realize tonight there's been gifts that you've had for 30 years in church and no one's ever spoken to them. Sorry, I had to interrupt you there because I really just no. feel like there's gifts that are being awakened and stirred up even right now. Hey, my friend, I, I'm in total agreement with, with what you're saying. And, and, and I'm glad you pointed that out. I will say this to, in addition to that, there are people who like, for example, you might think that you just are good at reading people and not recognize you have the gift of discernment. Mm. You might think that you're just a generous person, but you don't realize that you so have the gift good. of giving. You might think that, oh, people just kind of come to me because they like to talk to me and tell me their problems. Why do you think they're so comfortable opening up to you? It's because God gave you a grace for it, the gift of encouragement. So the, the spiritual gifts are um, uh, functioning sometimes in our lives without us knowing. And I'm going to show so you good. in a little bit how to discover your spiritual gifts. I'm going to give you three keys to discovering so your good. spiritual gifts that will absolutely open your eyes. Now, moving on to the gift of leadership. This is not just regular leadership. This is the gift of leadership, the grace of leadership. Same thing for service, same thing for administration or helps. Administration or helps is that organizational backing of the, of the ministry, of the church. This is all a part of supernatural ministry. You wouldn't think these things are supernatural. But the thing is, they're natural things supernaturally empowered, just like in the mm. book of Exodus, when those men were assigned to create the different utensils and items in the tabernacle. They were given that special grace and craftsmanship to create the things that Moses saw in heaven. And what Moses saw in heaven was able to be created in the earth because wow. the men had that spirit of excellence on them. And therefore, 
what we might deem as natural when it is graced by the Holy Spirit, by the nature of it becomes supernatural. Then, of course, there's the power gifts. Uh, Romans chapter 12, 6 and Romans 12, 10 uh, talk to us about the gift of prophecy. Now, prophecy has to do with future tense, okay? Mm. Future tense. Then there's the gift of discernment, 1 Corinthians 12, 10 also. This is the distinguishing between spirits. No, the gift of discernment is not the gift of criticism. Come on, say We it. often imagine that, oh, I have the gift of discernment, so I didn't feel right about that. I have a brother-in-law who was in a pretty popular band that was really rough sounding. And I wasn't a fan of the music, but I would go and support him because he was my brother-in-law or he is my brother-in-law. They're still happily married. And, <laughs> and so he, so he would, he would do these concerts and I wasn't a fan. I wouldn't go, they would all like push each other around in the, the pit in front of the, uh, the, the stage. And I would stand in the back. I would be cheering. But I was I'd in be, like, one of those bands. Safe, yeah. I would cheer from like a safe distance. Right. <laughs> And so I would watch this thing, but night after night, he would preach the gospel and people would get saved. Now, there was this lady who attended the, the services, and she's standing in the foyer. She doesn't know I'm related to the band. And she's saying, oh, oh, I just, I just sense the Holy Spirit is so grieved with this music, so mm. grieved. And I thought, I said, what do you mean specifically? Like, what, 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 what was it that grieved the Holy Spirit? She said, oh, these sounds, the sounds, they're just, it's dark in there, and there's these really, really dark sounds. And I'm thinking, okay, so now there's a certain decibel and frequency that upsets the Holy Spirit. Come I don't on. think that's the case. I think what happened was that she had a personal preference, and because it was against her Say personal it. preference, she blamed her, you know, discomfort on the discomfort of the Holy Spirit. That is not discernment. That's personal preference. But the gift wow. of discernment, quite simply, is the ability to decide what, what, what spirit someone's coming. Had she had discernment, she would have looked at it and said, oh, God is all over this. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 10 talks about the gift of healing. Some have um, postulated that the gift of healing here is something that you receive. So I received the gift of healing, therefore I was healed. But remember, we saw that in 1 Corinthians 12, 7. I, I told you I'd bring up this phrase again, that it was for others. So all of these gifts are toward others. So it's not me receiving my healing. The gift of healing is imparting that healing to others. Mm. 12, 10, also on miracles, same thing. What's the difference between healing and a miracle? Well, healing is like the physical body, the sickness leaving. That is by definition, a miracle, but the gift of miracles would include the multiplication of so food, walking good. on water, different things like this. And, and, and God gets very creative with that one, so it's a good one to have. Word of knowledge is a prophetic type of gift, but it's knowledge that you should not have then other than with divine aid. Mm. If you did not have the divine aid and you have this knowledge, okay, that's just some knowledge that you came to on your own. But if I know something about you, either past tense or present tense, remember prophecy is future, word of knowledge is past tense, present tense, I know where you came from, I know where you are, that's the word of knowledge. We see the word of knowledge working through Jesus at the woman at the well. He had a word of knowledge that was supernaturally given to him. The same with the good. word of wisdom. Is this okay, Isaiah, that so I'm good. listing yes, them all? Yes, 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 I love it. Okay, um, so the good. same thing is true with the word of wisdom. The word of wisdom is, is having to do with supernatural wisdom that I would not have otherwise obtained. So, Knowledge is the assessment of the situation or the information that's involved. Wisdom is knowing what to do. This is what Daniel had. This is, for example, when, when uh, Joseph interpreted the dream of Pharaoh, he was given that word of knowledge to interpret the dream. But then how did he know how to prepare Egypt for the famine? He was given the word of wisdom. And in fact, you can look mm. back at certain archaeological digs in the Middle Kingdom. By the way, people look in the New Kingdom for evidence about the Exodus. But if you actually look in the Middle Kingdom, you'll see that from the Nile River, Joseph built this waterway. They call it the Waterway of Joseph. And he actually was able to build it, like, almost like a second river. Who gave him that knowledge? That was wow. the word of knowledge wow. or the word of wisdom. The gift of faith. Remember, this is not my faith coming alive. The gift of faith is when I speak, I stir that faith in someone else. So this is good. one of the gifts. So people mistake the gift that I operate in. So I'm, I'm an evangelist with the teaching and healing gift. Yes, I can lay hands on the sick. But when you come to my services, I'm not operating in the gift of healing. I'm operating in the gift of faith. That's good. See, I, I go to the hospital. I'll lay hands on people. Yes, God works through, through servants like that. But in the services that I'm at, my job is to speak faith. And the gift of faith, people start to get their faith stirred, and people start getting healed all over the room. And that's the gift of faith in action. Then there's the gift of tongue and then tongues interpretation, which I'll touch on in a little bit. 
And then I'll just name the leadership gifts because I don't know. I think that'll be a whole different lesson for a whole different time. Evangelist, pastor, teacher, apostle, prophet. An evangelist is not a traveling minister. An evangelist is someone who's graced to win souls. Come on. A pastor is not the, the master of your life. A pastor is a shepherd who will Come guide on. you spiritually. A teacher is not necessarily just someone who knows the word, but someone who can explain the word in a way that's easy to understand. An apostle is not some guy with a business card that says that he Come started a, a, you know, a, a pyramid scheme with all these churches under him. An, an apostle is someone who can make disciples and plant churches. And then a prophet is not necessarily someone who just prophesies. Someone says, what's the difference between the office of the prophet and the gift of the prophet? Very, very simple. Two words, authority and influence. Mm. The prophet has a certain level of authority in the spirit and a certain level of authority to operate in the church. Now, okay, how do you discover your spiritual gifts? Spiritual gifts, and if I'm going too fast, please tell me. This I'm, I'm so trying good. to rush ahead this, no, no, to, this uh, is good. to tons here. Spiritual gifts, how do you discover your spiritual gifts? Number one, number one is desire. Mm. First Corinthians chapter 14, verse one says, let love be your highest goal. But you should also desire the special abilities the Spirit gives. So it's not wrong good. to desire a spiritual Say that. Gift. Say that, please. It's not wrong to desire a spiritual gift. It says it right there. Earnestly desire. Not just, hey, have a little want for it. He says, like, like almost ache for it. That's what it means, literally, to earnestly desire. It, it, it means to almost ache for, for, for this gift. It almost, to, to have this, this, where you're thinking about it constantly. Not that it becomes your focus, but that it does become a point of contention if you don't get it. I remember sitting in school. I grew up in, uh, I was raised charismatic Pentecostal, right? That's where I went to church, but I went to school at a private Baptist school. <laughs> so that's, that kind of created the unique blend of ministry that I am today. They're like, you're pretty calm for a Pentecostal. Like, you don't understand. I was, I, my, my, the word, I got the word and the spirit. Yeah, yeah. So, so in, in, in the Baptist school, I would sit in the history classes. And it's not like today uh, where, you know, you learn the history of, of the United States and the world. And it's just kind of from a secular agenda. But, but in that school, they allowed us to actually study Christian influence on nations, mm. which was beautiful. So we would read in history. You would have loved this, Isaiah. In our history classes, I would love going to school. Wow. In our history classes, we would learn about the Great Awakenings and the wow. revivals and the Welsh revival and the, 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 the revivals of, of Europe and the revivals of China and the revivals in the United I mean, everywhere. It was, it was, we learned about revival figures. But I remember sitting in that class. And every time I read the word evangelist, something started stirring in me. It was like this. I can't even explain it. Every time I read the word evangelist on that page, even in history class, I would feel that anointing come on me. And there was something about me where I would just cry. I said, Lord, I want to be an evangelist. I, mm. I didn't want to be a pastor. I love pastors, but it's not who I am. I didn't want to be a prophet. Yes, I prophesy, but I don't necessarily consider myself a prophet. Yes, I teach the word, but my goodness. I ached for that. I yearned, and, and doing it now, getting to travel the world and evangelize, I feel like that's where I come alive. That's so where everything good. just clicks perfectly. You don't understand if you don't, if you don't, if you're not feeling Isaiah, when you're on the platform, help me like explain this. When you're on the platform and you're preaching, you know what I mean when I sing yeah, it? Just yeah, click. yeah. Help me explain that. Well, yeah. How would you describe that? Man? For me, so especially when I'm preaching, I mean, I, for me, it's like watching third person. I tell people all the time, I can't do announcements. I can't speak good. People say, you make it look so easy, but it's when you do what you were born to do, something comes alive on the inside of you. You were made to do this. And I think people, you know, we're, I was talking on Friday about depression in the church and different prophets that dealt with depression. I think one of a major issue, why we're dealing with such high levels of depression, anxiety, and stress in the church is that we're not talking about spiritual gifts. We're not talking to people about why they're on the earth, what makes them come alive. And so people live their lives empty not fulfilling the call God has for them because you'll only be satisfied when you're fulfilling the call God has for your life it doesn't matter what job you have doesn't matter what car you have doesn't matter what you uh, drive doesn't matter who you're married to unless you're fulfilling the call that God has in your life you will live your life empty so you have to do what you're born to do Paul says if I don't do what I was made to do why God put me here my life is worthless so Paul says my life mm. has no value outside the gift and the anointing that God has given me my life has no value so you'll 
never come alive if you're not walking in the gift that God has given you. That's why some of you end up being youth pastors, you're miserable. Then you're a children's pastor, you're miserable. Then you're this. And then all of a sudden you run a prayer house in the church or you start running the deliverance ministry and you feel alive all of a sudden because your gifting and your calling was for that area. And But one of the things is we don't define gifts in the church. So everybody's a pastor now, right? Like everybody's a pastor. So the high goal is just be a pastor and pastor a church. We don't talk about the evangelist. We don't talk about the prophet. We don't talk about the apostle. We don't talk about the gift of miracles. We don't talk about the gift of healing. None of this. So then people get in, they're in wrong roles and they end up miserable because that's not where God called you or assigned you to be. So I would say absolutely you know, what you say. Go ahead. And you know where that comes from. I'm going to show you how that comes back to the status mentality mm. because we, we, we've, we've somehow structured things in the church. I get the comment all the time. And, and maybe I will pastor a church one day, but it'll be nothing like where I'm here locally. I mean, I, I said, if I ever start a church, it's going to be a Sunday night service and that's it. Yes, thank I'm you. I'm not going to be doing because that's you. not what I'm called to do. Yes. Um, but, you know, but but I, I've had so many people comment to me. They said, man, you're an evangelist, but one day God's going to God's gonna promote you to be a pastor. I said, promote me? <laughs> Come on. For me, that would be a demotion. Exactly. For me, it would be. because And then they're like waiting for you. And, I, and, and I've seen it happen where evangelists, just because they're struggling financially and with stability, they'll switch over and start a church and forsake that call, and they'll exchange it for what they think is going to give them stability and financial security. Mm. And now they're in this position where they have to start a church. They basically gave up on what God gave them. What happened to the nations? What happened to those visions of all the wow. crowds? What happened to all the traveling visions and all of that? And then, no, oh, they just throw it all aside and go in. Why? Because we imagine that, and like you said earlier, that we, we don't give honor to all the different gifts like we should. And especially in this culture, we honor the pastor because the pastor is most like the coach and the coach and influencer culture mm. says that's the way to go. So it's a real subtle thing that the enemy has done there. And I'm not saying we don't honor. I mean, I have a pastor over me and I thank God for my pastor. And, I, and that, that's my pastor. And he, he can speak into my life. He can rebuke me when I need to be rebuked. And he can help me when I need to be helped. Right. That's wonderful. But if you're not doing what God has specifically designed you to do, it's just not going to click. So here's the good news. Here's the good news. Number one, desire that that desire for a spiritual gift. So I love this. In and of itself is a sign that God wants to give you that gift. So good. I'll break that down for you. I'm going to say that again. And I want to break it down. That desire for a spiritual gift in and of itself is a sign that God wants to give you that gift. Mm. Now, why is that? How can that be? Well, would the devil put that desire in you? Say it. Would the, would the devil put this thing, this desire for the spirit? The devil may put the desire in you for the popularity that you think it might bring to you or the financial gain you might think it might bring to you. But the desire to do the thing itself could not come from the enemy. The same is true of the flesh. Sure, they, there may be some desire to be a pastor because you want to be celebrated, but that's the flesh. But would the flesh want have that desire to help people? No. Would the flesh have the desire to pastor people? No. So there are some things that could get mixed in because of the influence of the demonic or because of the influence of the flesh. But when it comes down to the pure desire itself to operate in that thing, where else could it come but from the Spirit? Spiritual so desires good. come from the Spirit. Number two, recognition. So number one, how, do you, how can you tell if you have a gift? Number one is desire. Number two is recognition. Proverbs 18, 16 says, A man's gift maketh room for him and wow. bringeth him before great men. When you have a gift, you don't have to go announcing it. Say that. It. When you have a gift, you don't have to go promoting it. Just allow God to use you. There's different levels of ministry influence when it comes to spiritual gifts. There's the personal influence. That's one-on-one. -on -one. There's corporate influence. That's within the church. There's regional influence. That's what I believe, Isaiah, you, you were probably there uh, several years ago when you had that revival breakout in Northern California. Mm. That was regional yep. influence. And now you're moving from regional to a national slash global influence, mm. right? So these are different levels of, of influence in the ministry. So just because you're not recognized nationally, or globally doesn't mean that someone can't say, oh yeah, they prayed for me and I got healed. Or, oh, you know what? You really encouraged me the other day. Or when you sat down with me in the scripture, it really helped me get through and understand some of the core concepts. 
Those are the recognitions that you should be looking for, not so. to be celebrated, but to help calibrate the direction of your life. And this doesn't mean, and I need to be clear here, this doesn't mean that just because your gift isn't recognized that it's non-existent. So this simply good. means that when the gift begins to function, recognition will come. And number three, this may seem like a very um, obvious one, but it needs to be said nonetheless. Number three is function. And that's 1 Corinthians 12, 4. There are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same spirit is the source of them all. In other words, he's working in them. Now, if I have a function of a gift, if I have that gift working in my life, then I actually am gifted in that area. Now, you might say, well, that seems really obvious, David. Why would you even need to mention that? It's because, as we alluded to earlier, some of you are functioning in the spiritual gifts and you don't even know come it. Come on, come on. You don't even realize it. Do you really think that, that you dream things out of the blue that come to pass in the next couple of days come on. just out of nowhere? Or do you think that's the gift of prophecy? Do you think that you have a heart of compassion for God's people and this earnest desire to guide them? Or could that be a pastoral gift developing? Come on, you? come on. Can you, can you go to the mall without being stirred? Whenever I can't even go to the mall or, or theme parks or anything. Because when I do, I mean, I enjoy myself, but I'm looking at the masses and going, yep. Lord, how many of them know you? How many of them, how many of them actually are, are saved? And everything in me is just like boiling over, wanting them to be one to the Lord. That's the gift of the evangelist. Do you really think that you just pray for the, you, you're drawn to pray for the sick people when you see that wheelchair come in that you're drawn to go and pray? Or do you think that's the gift of healing trying to come out of you? Mm. See, the function is often, it often goes ignored because we mistake the spiritual gifts for personality traits say when it. in fact they are a gift functioning in us. When I'm going to say this and I hope it's clear. When a spiritual gift is dormant, it can easily be mistaked, mistaken for a personality trait. Wow. When a spiritual gift is functioning, then it is revealed as the spiritual gift that it is. See, when I'm not doing anything with that desire, it looks just like desire. Wow. But when I act on that desire, let me ask you this. Here's a, good, here's a good question you can answer. What gift would be in operation if you acted on the spiritual desires that God gave you sometimes? Come on, come on. So, so think about that. If there's this desire to go pray for the sick, okay, what would happen if that person got healed? What would happen if you prayed for them and they got healed? What gift would that be? That's wow. the gift of healing. Therefore, that, that, that function within you, that, that drawing to go and pray, is the sign that you have a spiritual gift. So ask yourself, where is this desire coming from? From my flesh, from God, or the devil? Okay, it's from God, so it's in my spirit. Then ask yourself, what would result from this desire being manifested? and you've just discovered your spiritual gift. Now, wow. I want to talk to you real briefly, uh, people of God, real briefly, about the gift of speaking in tongues. So good. This, this is so key, okay? And I want to say, I'm going to interject here. All of you that are typing, saying, I want to speak in tongues so bad, tonight is your night. Guys, I'm telling you, I've read about 15 comments so far that say, I want to speak in tongues so bad. Tonight is your night. Don't even think, well, maybe, or I got prayer before. If you're thinking about, well, they prayed for me last time, or somebody laid hands on me a hundred times, tonight is a new night. We're not going to build a case against God and tell God why mm, he has I not like given that. it to you. To you. We're going to forget about the past. I see you, Maddie Grace. We're going to forget about the past, and today is a new day. Now's the day to receive it. So tonight, when we get done with this broadcast, we are going to pray for you, and let me just say this. You are going to speak in tongues, okay? It's not going to be, well, I don't know, and maybe, and I don't feel anything. You have to activate it. And this is what we're talking about. The gift has to be exercised. I remember when I first started going to the gym, okay? I haven't been in the gym in a while, so don't judge me. You know, the whole lockdown thing's been messing up my gym game. But I remember when I first started going to the gym, I woke up the next day, David, sore in muscles I did not know existed. Working out in ways, <laughs> I remember my brother showing me workouts like, oh yeah, this is for this muscle. I'm like, I didn't even know that muscle was there. <laughs> but the way I found out it was there is because I started exercising it. There are some right. of you that have gifts, as David just said, that are dormant and you don't know they're even there. But as you begin to exercise the gifts, you develop the gifts, you grow in the gifts. And what's sad is, and listen, thank God you're in here tonight. Thank God you're on this broadcast. Do not click off. Some of you are 40, 50, 60, 70 years old, and you're just realizing you've had gifts your entire life that have been dormant because somebody did not wake those gifts up in you. Somebody did not speak this into you and you got taught, you got taught a demonic doctrine that says don't pursue spiritual gifts. Yet Paul tells mm. us to pursue spiritual gifts. I love, I love this, David. If I could just add this, Paul talks about love. He says, yeah, love is the highest goal, right? But in the same verse, 
He says, but you should also desire the special ability the Spirit gives, which is what you read early. And then he says, especially the ability to prophesy. I love what Paul says. He gives us love and gifts in the same sentence. Here's why. Here's what Paul's saying. Nobody argues love. There's not a believer in history that has ever said, I don't really think we should love people. Every believer, whether you're Baptist, Pentecostal, Charismatic, you're an, you all know we need to love people. There's not one denomination on the earth that are, that's Christian that argues whether we should love people. So Paul says, we all should love. That's not debatable. He says, yet we should also pursue spiritual gifts. And why is it that the same sentence Paul talks about love, he says, we need to desire spiritual gifts. Because Paul's saying is, if we're not arguing over whether we should love people, why are we arguing whether we should be walking and supernatural and i love i love even more than spiritual gifts i love how he says spiritual abilities supernatural abilities it almost just sounds like you know some type of superhero thing but paul is saying these are abilities guys these are spiritual things we're able to tap into and we're able to access the spirit realm if i could share the story i remember i was preaching in arizona you know i believe i have the gift of word of knowledge and oftentimes you know when i'm done preaching i'll flow some of you have seen me do this flow and word of knowledge well, I'm in the middle of preaching large church and I'm like, okay, you don't stop in the middle of your preaching to do stuff. You just preach and that's what you do. And the Lord kept telling me over and over again, there's somebody in this room is a massive church that lives on Cherry Lane. Mind you, I'm in another state that I've, that I've been to once or twice. And the Lord says, there's somebody that lives on Cherry Lane in this room and I want to touch them tonight. So in the middle of my message, I stopped preaching and I said, I'm sorry guys, but I have to say there's somebody in this room that lives on Cherry Lane and God says he wants to touch you. That was a supernatural word of knowledge, information I did not know that God gave me in the middle of a service. A kid in the back of the room, mind you, the building seats over a thousand people, in the very back of the room, I have a picture of this on my Instagram, if you guys don't believe me. I have a picture of Cherry Lane and the kid. Raises his hand, I go next to him, he goes, there's a kid next to him with his head down crying. He said, my friend right here, I've been bugging to come to church all day, he's an atheist. He lives hmm. on Cherry Lane. And he said, when you called him out, he literally told God when he walked in, I need you to prove yourself. And as I was preaching, he thought this was all rubbish. It was, you know, it was totally not real uh, for all my UK people, complete rubbish. And he says, <laughs> as you were preaching, you called out his, literally the street he lives on. Now he got touched. He's crying. We prayed. It was to edify him, right? It wasn't to make me look good, all this type of stuff. After that, I literally looked up Cherry Lane. There was like three houses in Arizona that were on <laughs> Cherry Lane. And I thought, but the but think about this. How many times, as you were talking a minute ago, I thought about this. How many times have we ignored our spiritual gifts? I would have just ignored yeah. it saying, God, I'm going to look crazy. No one's going to raise their hand. They're going to think I'm stupid. What am I going to do? Because the reality is, you guys got to remember this. The gifts are supernatural. So when the supernatural gifts begin to flow, your natural man, and we all know this if you've ever walked in spiritual gifts, is going to try to deny them or try to talk you out of them because your natural man says, how is there anyone in here lives on Cherry Lane? Are you kidding me? There's no way. That's stupid. There's only, you know, a thousand people in this room. There's a hundred thousand people in the city. But the spiritual man, you have to be, let, be the loudest voice in your life and say, no, no, no. I'm going to begin to exercise these gifts. I'm going to let these gifts begin to speak out. Let me share one more. I was in a church in San Francisco. And the Lord told me the last four digits of someone's social security number, which I don't hardly do this, but it was so specific. So I said, okay, there's somebody in here and here, and the Lord is giving me the last four of your social security number, which probably is not the best thing to say over a mic. And I have a picture of this on my Instagram if, for all the, all the haters that say it's fake. And I said, okay, I called it out. It was, it was maybe like 200 people in the room. So it wasn't like a massive, a massive amount of people. The girl in the right. front row who I've known for years starts crying, pulls her social security card out of her um, purse, which I don't carry my social security card on me, but she did. Pulls it out, that's me, that's me. Shows me the last four of her social security. I have her cover up the front, shows the church the last four, and the Lord says, I've showed you this, Isaiah, because I asked the Lord why, because I want to fill her with the Holy Spirit. Mind you, she's been in this church for years, and like some of you, I saw some of you in here tonight, and I had to stop to say this, you've been asking for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. She had been praying for years for the baptism. The Lord gives me this word of knowledge to show her, give her the faith to believe tonight is your night to be baptized. That night, hmm. she began to speak in tongues, was baptized. This, is, this was like five or six years ago. She is, to this day, still on fire, and will account that moment to the moment she was awakened and was born again. So I'm saying, guys, there's people waiting on your obedience. There's people waiting on your yes. And when you begin to, after this, this teaching tonight, and you begin to activate and walk in your supernatural gifts, you will never be the same. 
Your world mm. will never be the same. Your faith will never be the same. Your family will never be the same. Your church will never be the same. It's time for us to break the box. I don't care what some religious leader told you that the gifts were for yesterday. If that's what the church you're at, then guess what? Find a new church. You need to get in a place where they're fanning the flame, as Paul said. They're throwing logs on your fire and gas and start walking. Sorry, I had to interject that because I know there's some of you that are saying, I don't know if I'm going to get it tonight. Tonight is your night to speak in tongues. I'm telling you, tonight is your night, 100%. You got to come share those stories on, on the program. Man. I'm down. I'm down. Amazing. Anytime. I, I, I just, every time I hear you, you talk, you make me want to come on. Like I said, run, run through a you're, wall. You're right firing now. me up, bro. You're firing me up with this. I'm learning right now. I love it. So see now what would have happened, Isaiah, had you not obeyed the voice yes. of the Holy Spirit? That atheist would have come in. He would have said, yep. well, nothing happened. Probably shook his world up. Mm. And this is why it's so important we to be attentive to the Holy Spirit. Now, concerning the gift of tongues, so just good. a couple things. Um, there, there, are, there are a few mental hurdles to get over. I'm going to name one mental hurdle, and then I'm going to name the main hurdle that why most people can't pray. So them. good. And some of you have heard this before, and, and, and some of you have, have, have heard this before and not applied it. My, my mm. issue is you have to apply it. If you apply it, you will pray in tongues, so period. So good. So in, 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 in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul the Apostle asks a rhetorical question. And he says, do all have gifts of healing? Do all pray with tongues? And of course, he is saying, no, they do not. Now, 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 remember, though, that 1 Corinthians 12 is talking about, 1 Corinthians 12, 7, the manifestation of others-centered praying in mm. tongues. And the gift that was mentioned in 1 Corinthians 12 is tied together with the gift of interpretation, meaning it's the one that's used in a public church setting. So Paul so the Apostle good. is not saying that you, not everybody can Say pray it. in the personal prayer language. He's saying that not everyone can pray with the prophetic gift of tongues. Also, he says, desire to pray in tongues, that you should so earnestly good. desire this gift. Now, why would Paul the Apostle write that you should desire something that God does not want to give to you? Mm. And then why would the Holy Spirit allow that to be written in the Scripture? Second of all, so or third good. of all, in Acts chapter 2, verse 33, Peter stands up and he says, this is the promise of the Father, what you see and hear. What were they seeing? They were seeing the Holy Spirit come upon people. They were hearing them praying in tongues. Then in verse 39 of Acts chapter 2, he says, this is for you— and for all who are far off, and for all who will believe. In other words, it's for every believer. So in 1 Corinthians 12, when Paul, the, when Paul the Apostle is talking about the gifts that are not for everyone, he was talking about the public manifestation, according to verse 7, the others centered. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 2, Paul the Apostle says that when you pray in an unknown tongue, nobody can understand you, for you're speaking only to God. And then in verse 4, he says that it edifies you personally without the need for interpretation. So he could not be talking about the same manifestation of the Spirit as it has to do with public church settings. So this notion that the gift is not for everyone based solely on 1 Corinthians 12 is just unfounded. So good. That's one verse where Paul the Apostle is talking about a gift for public expression compared to multiple verses where Paul the Apostle tells us that we should desire this gift. Now, what is praying in tongues? In Romans chapter 8, verse 26, the Bible talks to us about groanings that cannot be uttered. Now, for eight, uh, Romans chapter 8, 26 is not talking about the gift of tongues. What it's talking about is this inner reality. Watch this now. So good. This inner fellowship where the Holy Spirit prays for you. Oh, this is, so I, I'm, I'm getting stirred. To talk about it. So the Holy Spirit prays for you. Think about it. The Holy Spirit who knows you better than anyone else. First Corinthians chapter two, verses 10 through 12 tell us that the Holy Spirit searches out the deep things of God and he knows those things. And then he communicates those things to our spirit, which is just a powerful truth. The Bible also tells us that he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Okay, so the Holy Spirit prays for all believers. That's Romans 8, 26. 1 Corinthians 14, 14 tells us that when I pray in tongues, my what? My spirit is praying. Mm. Watch this now. Watch this now. My spirit will always agree with the Holy Spirit. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17. So put these three together. The Holy Spirit prays for me, number one. Number two, when I pray in tongues, my spirit is praying. Number three, when I'm praying in tongues in the spirit, I'm praying in agreement with the Holy Spirit. Therefore, praying in tongues is the Holy Spirit praying for you through you. 
Wow. It's as if the wow. Holy Spirit is saying, Ooh. I'll pray for you myself if you just give me a mouth. Come on. Now, there's a story. I've never heard that. That is so good. There's a story of this little girl who was learning to pray. And her father wanted to teach her this new spiritual practice. So he takes her into her room. And before she goes to bed, Isaiah, you have, uh, well, you have how many daughters now? About nine. <laughs> oh, I got three. <laughs> I got a fourth one on the way. Fourth one on the way. So I, I, I know you probably have done this. You teach your little girls to pray. I, I do what's called a bedtime blessing for my little Aria. She knows that when I put my hand on her head, I sit her on my lap every night, put my right hand over her head and bless her. She knows not to move. She just, she's only <laughs> one so year, good. but she knows she's you don't move when year. daddy's praying. Yeah. So she waits and then she's, and then after a while she starts to push me off. But <laughs> anyway, but I'm going to teach her to pray. And that's what this father was doing. Mm. He would kneel beside her and he said, we're going to pray. And he says, dear, dear Lord, dear Lord, I ask you, I ask you. And they prayed together. He, she would repeat him. Sometimes she would pray her own prayers. She would pray for mom and for dad and the dog and the cat and things that little girls pray for. So after a few nights of this, the dad says, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step aside and I'm going to let her pray on her own now. So he steps aside from the room the next night. He leaves and he just kind of puts his ear to the door. The little girl begins to sing the alphabet, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and on and on she goes. She sings it over and over again. He goes, hmm, that's odd. He comes back the next night. She does it again. The next night she does it again. And by this time, he's a little concerned. He says, well, if I don't teach her now that that's not really how you pray. She's going to think this is how you pray. So he goes, I'm going to allow this for one more night. Tomorrow night, I'm going to come in and teach her properly. So he comes the next night. She starts again, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. She's singing it in her little voice over and over again. So he knocks on the door and gently uh, kneels by the bedside and says, sweetie, listen, I know you're sincere and you're praying the alphabet. He says, but that's no way to pray. You have to pray actual words that you mean and that you can talk to God with. And she says, Daddy, I am praying. She says, I'm just saying the alphabet, and then I'm letting God make up all the words. Come on. That's, That's what happens when you pray in tongues. Mm. You see, when I pray with my understanding, I'm speaking words and attaching my own meaning to them. Some have said, I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. How can you be filled with the Holy Spirit when you're filled with yourself? Say it. How can Say anything it. be filled with the Holy Spirit when it's filled with something else? Mm. The Holy Spirit can only fill that which is empty. So if I want him to fill my words, my words must be empty. Wow. My words wow. must be void of meaning. My words must have nothing attached to them. When I pray in tongues, I'm not attaching any meaning. I'm just giving him the syllables and sounds, and he himself is adding the meaning to them. Now, 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 the biggest reason, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to be straight up with you. I'm going to tell you why you can't pray in tongues. Come on. And at first, you're not going to like me, and then I'm going to walk through this with you, and then you're going to go, okay, that makes sense. Now, you may have said, but I tried. I want it. I've done my best. I've done everything I could. I'm going to tell you the truth now. The reason you cannot pray in tongues after you've received the prayer to receive the Holy Spirit, after you've gone from conference to conference, the reason you can't pray in tongues, one word and one word only, it's your ego. Mm. You can't pray in tongues because of your ego. Plain and I don't care what, you, what story you make about your past, what story you make about why you didn't or how you were nervous. Or, it's ego. When we go to pray in tongues, I'll tell you what happens. When you start feeling that unction and you go to speak that first syllable what's the first thought that's just me yep absolutely oh that can't be god oh what if it's the enemy what if it's another spirit what if i'm just making this up is this the blasphemy of the holy spirit all these thoughts coming to the mind that's over analysis another thing that comes to mind is i'll look foolish can i just settle the matter matter for you People ask, well, I look silly when I pray in tongues. My answer is yes. yes. You're going to look very silly praying in tongues. You're going to look like weird, okay? We are strange Come on. beings, Come on. we spirit-filled believers. You're going to look silly, and you're just going to have to accept that. Mm. Leave it to God in all his wisdom to leave such power, the power of praying in tongues, hidden beneath the childlikeness of praying a language of faith. Come on. 
Leave it to God in all his wisdom to hide that power behind such a childlike act that I have to humble myself to pray. Really, it is just this. I give him the syllables and sounds and the Holy Spirit fills him. You may say, wait a minute, but in the Bible, they didn't have any control. I, I, I'm waiting for God to come, the Holy Spirit to grab my tongue and start moving it around. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. Paul the Apostle, remember, just he wrote a whole chapter, 1 Corinthians 14, on how to control the gift. Come on. Why would Paul the Apostle command us to control the gift if the gift could not be controlled? I'm not saying there's no unction to it. What I am saying is there's a partnership to it. Yes. It's like when I get into my car and I start the engine. If I turn that key, I myself am not going in and causing all of the combustion to take place and moving that engine and causing it to roar. All I did was turn the key. So good. But I had to turn the key to start the engine. In the same way, you have to provide the sounds. You have to step out on faith. It really is as simple as this. I speak forth the sounds in faith and trust that he's going to begin to fill those with his meaning. Now, the, the sounds are completely 100% in your control. The spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. Praying in tongues is a gift of tongues. Some have said, but when I received the gift of tongues, I couldn't control it. You may have felt as though you couldn't control it, but remember, self-control is the fruit of the spirit. So the spirit would good. not come on you and take away control. You may have felt like that because there was a euphoric flow to it that happens sometimes, but you still allowed the sound yes. to come through your mouth. Okay, so there's somebody watching me right now. You're, you're hearing what I'm saying. You're getting excited. You're saying, okay, maybe your heart's pounding a little right now. You're I'm thinking, getting excited. I already speak in tongues, bro. I'm ready to get in. Like, <laughs> you might be saying, okay, it it's time for me to step out. It's time for me to go and, and, and just begin to give them the syllables and sounds. And now is the time to do it. So I want all across the stream, everyone yes. watching, whether you're watching at home, whether you're watching at church, wherever you are, I want you right now, if you can, as long as you're not on the road, if you're on the road, you can still pray in tongues. Trust <laughs> Come me. On. I want you to close your eyes right now. And I want you to welcome the Holy Spirit. I'm going to ask my friend, the Holy Spirit, to move through this camera, to go right to where you are, and to stir that gift in you. And here's what's going to happen. You're going to feel something rising. Whether you feel it emotionally or physically, it does not matter. Something in the spirit is going to be different. It's not a feeling I can describe. And then there's going to come this moment where you, you sense it's like right here. You're going to want to utter something, even if it's just a slight muddled sound. You're going to want to utter something. But then your mind is going to try to push it back down with fear, with overanalysis, with overthinking. You have full control over whether or not you pray in tongues right now. Mm. That's the revelation that sets you free. So, Father, in Jesus' name, I pray for the power and presence of the Holy Spirit to be manifested in that room. He's in the room with you right now. He's looking at you right now. And so, Father, I pray in the name of Jesus, stir up that gift. Now pause for a moment. Be quiet just for a moment, people of God, right in your room. There's something stirring on the inside. Allow that to come out. Don't lie to yourself. Don't say that's just me. Don't say that's the enemy. Just utter the sound. And something, you'll sense it in the Spirit. Something will take over. Jesus, baptize us with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Kiriondo soto reme bebe senterie nemeneki. Korobo senterie mene senti. The anointing of the Holy Ghost is here. Stir up, stir up that gift. Just speak it out. I rebuke the lies of the enemy that would cause you to have doubt. Be bold. Speak it out in Jesus' name. Receive your prayer language in Jesus' name. Now, I would like to know in the comments what you guys are sensing. And those of you, let me know if you just prayed in tongues in the comment section. I, Pastor Isaiah, what are you sensing right yes, now? Yes, yes. So I want you guys, please let us know what you're feeling. I know some of you are. I want to say a quick prayer. I know there's several of you that came in here in the beginning that said that you just, you're super sick um, and, you've, and you've been 
tested positive for COVID-19. I know there, I know probably 15, 20 people personally that are very sick. Several of them are in the hospital, but very sick with COVID. As we know, it's not news. It's spiking. I want to pray. I believe tonight God is going to break COVID-19. I don't know why it is we have faith for all these other diseases, but we don't have faith that God can heal us of COVID-19. As I told you last week, a girl sent a testimony saying all the pain, all the aches, all the breathing problems are gone. So yes, there's several people right now are typing saying I got tested positive. So tonight we are going to break COVID-19. Father, we ask you in Jesus' name that you would release healing, that you would release breakthrough, and that you would release deliverance. We are not beggars, we are believers, and we bind every demonic power of COVID-19. We come against the coronavirus in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you that we don't earn healing. It is a gift, and you took 39 lashes so that tonight people can be supernaturally healed. So I speak to those in the chat that have that have tested positive and I command your lungs to be healed. I command your lungs to be restored. I come against all sickness. I come against all disease. I come against all fever in Jesus name. We command that fever to go down. We command that pain to go. We command that loss of breathing to go in Jesus name. I speak over those that have been writing me saying I have massive fear thinking I'm going to catch this and die. I bind fear now in Jesus' name. We rebuke the spirit of fear. Fear, you have no place. You have no power. You have no authority. We speak the Holy Spirit's power to be released through this broadcast. We ask for divine healing and restoration right now in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you that you're healing. We thank you that your word says we have not because we ask not. So tonight, we ask you for an outbreak of divine healing. We ask you for those that don't speak in tongues to begin to speak in other tongues. And we just ask, Lord, loose them right now in Jesus' name. Break off every strategy and lie that the enemies tried to feed them that they can't speak in it or that they're going to stay sick. We come against it now in Jesus' name. We speak the healing power of, of the power of God to be released in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord. Thank you. Let us know, guys. I'm telling you guys, God is moving. Healing is breaking out. This was the best teaching I have ever heard on the gifts of the Holy Spirit and tongues. That whole phrase that you said about the uh, tongues is the Holy Spirit in you, praying through you, for you, something like that. The whole, oh. the, the gift, when you pray in tongues, the Holy Spirit's praying for you, through you. So, so good. Um, thank you. Thank you, guys. I want to say this. I'm going to bless um, David tonight regardless please guys partner with us please support tonight I asked him he's gone way over and done way more than we even expected and he has not asked for a dollar he didn't say oh it's going to be this or that to bring me on 100% came on without asking for anything I text him he said yes let's do it um, these are not guys these are not just some random people I'm inviting these are heavy hitters in the kingdom of God these are generals in the kingdom of God I felt blessed and honored to have men like David on tonight to teach to share you guys are getting I'm saying this tonight filet mignon I'm telling y'all right now <laughs> we've averaged we have over 600 viewers still we've averaged over 600 viewers this entire stream guys wow. I know throughout this week it'll reach over 100,000 people I have no question about that partner with us guys help us out there's links there's the donation link on top there's the monthly partnership cash up venmo link and then there's david's content link i want you guys and i need you guys to sign up for his email list tonight also i want to say this there's his name and page in the description if you go to his facebook he has all his information on his facebook so please guys um so into the ministry don't dine and dash if god bless you i got rocked i got blessed that's why i'm sewing tonight Please sow into the ministry and help me bless him. Um, David, I don't know what to say. Go ahead. Go for it. May I say something? And yes. I hope you don't mind me saying, and Isaiah did not ask me to say this, but when it comes to ministries like the ministry of Isaiah Saldivar, he, he mentioned I didn't ask for anything. And the reason is, is because I believe in investing in, mm. in men of God like this. And, and, you know, he can't say this because, you know, it would sound weird coming from him. But here's the reality. You look at the large ministries all around the world, and I think I think we think that that the, the large ministries are just the large ministries, and that's it. And then the small ministries are the small ministries, the medium size and medium size. But you have to realize the difference between the larger ministries that make the impact and the ones that don't. Yes, it's the touch of God, and we know that the touch of God is on this ministry. But one of the major factors is whether or not the people support it. Mm. I think it's a temptation that we have as we see the big ones. And of course, you know, we send our support and man, look at all they're doing. But do you realize that you can begin to support Isaiah Saldivar's ministry right now 